that last video was a bit rushed, so I'll just say that again. We want to show that, start with a prime number P. If P divides AB, then either P divides A or P divides B. So we use this fact, that if we've got a pair of numbers whose highest common factor is 1, we can definitely express it like this. Rx plus Sy equals 1. Okay, now back to the proof. So we suppose that this is true, but that P does not divide A, so we have to show that P divides B. If we can do that, then we're done, right? Because the whole situation is symmetrical. So if, on the other hand, we knew that P did not divide B, we would have to conclude that P divided A. All right? So suppose that P does not divide A, but P is prime, right? So the highest common factor of P and A has to be 1. Because if P is prime, the only possible factors of P are 1 and P. So if P doesn't divide A, then the only possible common factor is 1. Right? So now we use this fact that we can definitely find an R and S such that RP plus SA equals 1. And now we use a trick. This is a trick. 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 Which is that we now multiply the whole thing by B to get RPB plus SAB equals B. Now, let's have a look. We're trying to find that P divides B, right? But P definitely divides this because it's got P right there inside it. P definitely divides that because that's what we started with. P divides AB, so it definitely divides SAB. And if P divides this plus that, this and that, then it definitely divides the sum. So we conclude that P must divide the right-hand side as well. So we're done. This is the kind of proof I would call a completely non-explanatory proof because it kind of doesn't give you any more insight into what this result, what's going on in this result. We use this trick here, which didn't explain anything. It just, but it certainly did prove it. It just didn't probably help you understand the situation. I think the thing that helps you understand the situation is if you kind of think it through. Well, P can't be split apart, so in order for it to go into A times B, it would have to all go into A or all go into B, otherwise it would split apart. So there is a converse to this theorem. Conversely, So let's call this property star. Suppose P has the property star, then P is prime. We're going to prove this by using the contrapositive. So the contrapositive, remember, the contrapositive of blur implies blah, is not blah implies not blue. And it's exactly equivalent to the thing that we started with. So the contrapositive is, suppose P is not prime, if P is not prime, then P does not have this property. Does not have the property star. Well, this is kind of easy, right? If P is not prime, then we can write it as something times something else in a non-trivial way. And then we can use that to contradict this. So if P isn't prime, if P is not prime, And P equals A, B for A and B not equal to 1. That's a non-trivial factorization of P. Well, in that case, we can just say P divides A, B, but P doesn't divide A or, or B, right? Then P divides A, B, but P does not divide A because P is A times something bigger, right? And P does not divide B, because P is B times something bigger. 
That's why it's important for a and b not to be equal to 1, right? Because otherwise, if, p, if a equals 1, then p would divide b, right? But a is bigger than 1, so p is bigger than b. So p can't possibly divide b, because then it would have to be smaller than b. Okay? So what we've shown is that if p is not prime, it definitely does not have this property. Which means that if it does have this property, then it definitely had to be prime. So what we conclude is that this property exactly characterizes the prime numbers. Um, so this property, this exactly characterizes prime numbers. What that means, what exactly characterizes means, is that instead of testing, instead of using the property about whether you can break prime numbers apart, you can use this property instead. Now you might wonder why on earth you'd want to use such a convoluted property instead of that other one. And the answer is, maybe you wouldn't, but this one, is, this one can be more useful if you want to use the fact that your number is prime to prove something else. This one can often be more useful for using it, whereas the other one might be more useful for testing to see whether a number is prime in the first place. Now, there's still a hole in that previous proof, right? We still have to prove that thing about Rx plus Sy equals 1 if the highest common factor of x and y is 1. And I don't think there's time in this video, so we'll do that next time using Euclid's algorithm.